throw them back in the Bible class that uh, I wasn't talking about it enough. And I'll do my best to speak up. My wife is going to get over before I got up here so don't talk too long. That's not what she usually tells me. Hold on. But, uh, I hear myself real well, so I know everybody else could, I suppose. But nonetheless, I want you to know how much we have anticipated that we're forward to this coming uh, to this gospel meeting and to the invitation that has been given to us. I'm glad I'm not the only one that has broken on. John Martin did a bad job of leading or singing. You know, I never thought about John Martin being a song leader, but I should sure have. Because of uh, his dad knowing music and being a good song leader for the years that, uh, that we lived in as well. Come back this evening at 5 and tell your friends, your family members, others uh, that you may have an influence over and invite them to come and be with you. Encourage them, if you will, to bring their Bibles. I want to express that, that we're going to be reading from the Bible. Contrary to uh, maybe a lot of preachers that you may hear and see on the radio or TV, we use the Bible. And uh, we'll do our very best to give the book, chapter, and verse for those passages uh, that we'll be using. And we'll be using plenty of scripture to make our points. And so we encourage uh, your friends and others when they come to be with you to bring their Bibles. Bring your Bibles. Don't just accept what I have to say face back. I want you to have the attitude of the Marines. You know, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word of all and us mind and search the scriptures daily for the those who were sold. And you know, they were studying after the apostles. And if they saw a need to uh, study after the apostles, there surely must be a need for you to study that to me to, again, not take my word for it, but to, uh, to make sure that what I'm saying is from the Word of God. Then in Bethlehem, for me, well, we'll be starting 35 years, October the 27th of uh, this year, if the good Lord and the brethren are willing, we enjoy and we love the church there in Bethlehem. We're so happy to have been afforded the privileged opportunity of being with them all these years. If they have gotten as much out of our relationship as I have, then it's been a time well spent. We are at peace, we love one another there, and we strive to uh, stand and speak with the Bible speaks and to preach on the Word of God. Just because the gospel meeting has been done doesn't mean that our working for the success of the gospel meeting must be done. We have a uh, through Wednesday evening to invite, to invite our friends, our neighbors, our family members, and encourage them to come and instead of God's work with us. I look at the song that I meant to write the number down. God give us Christian hope. I believe that I remember the Reddit's 186. Our nation is in a turmoil. I know that's not a good thing. I know that each and every one of us realize the mess that our nation is in. And I believe one of the problems for our, or one of the reasons for our problem as a nation it is the problems that the whole is having. For a long time, it's been stated that about half of the marriages that have done in the divorce. I don't know that that is a true perspective on the number of divorces that are taking place. And even if it is, I wonder, out of all of those 50% of marriages that stay together. How many of them are happy marriages? Now I'm not suggesting that they have that there are not problems in any marriage, that there are not disagreements and, and a vessel of fun. But when everything is said and done, Christians make the effort 
to have a godly home, to have indeed a Christian home. God give us Christian homes, the Psalms says. I want to talk about the subject under that title this morning. God give us Christian homes. First of all, you and I need to realize that God instituted marriage. There are three institutions that God began that are in the home, that of law, and that of the Lord's church. These institutions, the first of which is the home, is the oldest, and it has God's authority. It has His approval. The home was given to man to propagate the population of the earth. And uh, there are certain guidelines, there are certain prerequisites that God expects all of us to live by if our homes are to be what God would happen to be. Notice, please, Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman, because she was taken out of me. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Well, as it is with any institution, as it is with any business, even, there must be a government in place to regulate the activities of that institution or of that uh, business. Well, God has given us a government to regulate the home. And again, this is one reason I believe that the home is in trouble today is because Men have either turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to the pleadings of God, or they simply ignored what the Bible says and tried to substitute for His divine commands. Please notice what is stated about Abraham in Genesis 18 and verse 19, where the Lord says, For I have known him that uh, I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the word of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. You see, God put into place the idea that the parents are to be the lawmakers for the home. Now, how many homes violate that principle of God? I've used this before at that point. And I, I, I don't know that it really indicates the point that I'm trying to see to help us to see what we should avoid. But I had an aunt and uncle who lived in Indiana when I was a child growing up. And they had a son, he was my cousin. And when they would ride home, my aunt recited Donnie, Eileen, and Clovis. Now they, they may not have intended anything negative about that or anything to violate the makeup of the home and the government of the home. But it struck me odd that my cousin's name would come before my uncle's name or before my aunt's name. I hope that that wasn't the makeup of that home. And, and I, I'm not sure that it was, but I, I, it just struck me as being odd. But you know, in a lot of homes today, that is the way the home is ruled. It is the children that get their way Maybe in spite of uh, the pleadings, the threats, and that sort of thing with the, uh, with the family, with the parents. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 is a passage that I guess all of us, at least if we come from me to this when I read it to you, can quote. And yet it is one of the most disbelieved passages in all of the Bible. The passage says this, Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now the reason I say that passage is disbelieved is when you uh, see a situation in a Christian home where there are problems. And uh, that child or those children within that home go astray. 
Someone that just bowed the point out, well, the Bible doesn't know what it's talking about. God didn't know what he was talking about. I don't know that I have all of the explanation as to why that may be based upon what Solomon says, but I still believe God knows what he's talking about. I still believe God has the answers to the problem of the families and the home in our society. If we will but listen to His will and abide by His commandments. We live in a day and age today where God is kicked out of just about everything. We've kicked God out of government. We've kicked God out of schools. We've kicked God out of, in some instances, churches. And we've kicked God out of the home in a lot of instances. Well, when we do that, we're looking for problems. We're begging for problems. One of my favorite passages as it relates to the home, as it relates to parental responsibility, is Ephesians 6 and verse 4, where Paul says to you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There's a right way and a wrong way for a man to be a father. And many have chosen the wrong way, either by relinquishing their responsibility or not being the responsible parent that they should be. Now I want to look in the next point at the responsibilities of the members of the home. Please understand that whether you're the husband or whether you're the wife, and I say when I say husband, I'm including the father. When I say wife, I'm including the mother. Or whether you're the young person within that home, there is a responsibility that is yours that only you can discharge by being obedient to that responsibility. <laughs> Ephesians 5 and verse 22, Paul says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I think it was back in the 1970s when this uh, Equal Rights Amendment and process began. We live today in a society that has N-O-W. Now, I know we, we know that spells now, but it also stands for National Organization of Women. I don't misunderstand me, especially with ladies. I understand that in many, many instances, the woman in society has been abused and neglected. I understand that. But I don't believe the solution to that problem is to sidestep God's authority. I don't believe the solution is to take on yourselves that role in the family, that role in society that is supposed to belong to the man. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. A lot of marriage ceremonies uh, have the line in it to obey. A lot of women don't want that in their marriage ceremonies. Well, you know, I guess that's all right. I guess that's all right if you don't want it in the marriage ceremony. That doesn't change God's word, does it? Let's look also in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians, where Paul focuses his attention to the husbands. Here's what he says to the husbands. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, as we noticed, at least in passing in our Bible class here in the auditorium, a lot of times the husband loves somebody else's wife. That's not what the scripture says. Is it? When that happens, you're destroying at least two homes, maybe more. Husbands are to love 
their own lives. There is a law that should be in the heart of every husband for his wife like no other. I know a lot of husbands that have failed to meet this obligation and failed to meet this responsibility. Paul gives us an example in case there's any question. In case you're not sure of what he's talking about, Paul gives us an illustration. He gives us an example. He says, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That tells me that the love that the husbands are to have for their wives is to be a sacrificial love. And again, we don't always see that. Going to the next chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, the first three verses. Paul says, children, that's a child of any age that is living at home under the authority of the parents. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. He goes on to say, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Now, we looked at uh, the three elements of the home. And I realized we're home to our no children present. I realized we're home for one of the mate has passed away or maybe ended the marriage and divorce. I realized there are some extenuating circumstances. But when you look at the overall makeup of a home, God has given us a pattern, has it? And brethren and friends, I believe that if we will get back to following this pattern in our homes, our homes will be better. We can truly have a Christian home. I'm afraid one of the elements, one of the key elements, that is often left out of many marriages, many homes, is that of forgiveness. I don't guess there's ever been a couple. I don't guess there's ever been a home where there was not a need for forgiveness periodically. I don't guess there's ever been a home where there was not a disagreement. Maybe a serious disagreement. I don't guess there's ever been a home where there was not a problem where one was guilty and the other innocent. Well, these are not un these are not circumstances, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that cannot be overcome. And I believe the one word that we ought to in our homes keep to the forefront. Of our is that a forgiveness? Far too many husbands are not willing to forgive their wives. Far too many wives are not willing to forgive their husbands. I'm thinking about a passage that uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians where he says, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Too many husbands go to bed at night angry with their wives. Too many wives go to bed at night angry at their husbands. I believe that's a violation of what Paul says. Situations will occur, as you very well probably know, where there may be feelings that are expressed uh, angry at you. Take care. Before you come to bed, take care. Before you close your eyes for a night's sleep, I guess you realize the reason for that. One of you may not wake up the next day. We may be out into eternity the next day. We may not have an opportunity to make things right with our faith. Forgiveness is and must be the key. 
I don't know why I use the example that I'm about to give you for forgiveness other than to show its importance and to show that there should be no man. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him, that is to Christ, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him up to seven times? You know, I suspect that when Peter raised that question, and when he placed the number seven before our Lord, he probably thought he was being generous. He probably thought, well, if, if I'm just to forgive seven times, I've gone over and, and beyond what my obligations ought to be. Maybe he was patting himself on the back in a spiritual lesson. Well, uh, that, that's to be generous. And the answer that our Lord gave must have shocked his soul. Must have shocked him to the core because here's Jesus' answer. He says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Now, all of us can do the math on that, and maybe we're falling in line with Peter saying, Well, if I can kill uh, my mate that many times, I've done what the Lord will require. Well, that is quite generous, isn't it? But should it stop at that point? That's not what Jesus is teaching. That there is a limit, there is a stopping point where we can give our money and they uh, sin against us as we are considering the home. Whether they transgress uh, what it must be within the home. You know, I'm thankful for forgiveness. I'm so thankful, first of all, that God was willing to send his son to die for me. And that Jesus was willing to come to this whole land of sin and to endure perhaps the worst of all measures of capital punishment ever devised by man. I'm thankful for forgiveness. But not only am I thankful for the forgiveness of my Heavenly Father or my Savior, but I'm thankful that my wife has a forgiving spirit. I didn't tell you this about us in the introductory remarks, but the good Lord willing, come June the 18th of this year, 42 years. Now, if you want to know what patience looks like, take a look at my wife. That's, that's patience. Because I realize I haven't always been easy to live with. We need forgiveness in our homes if our homes are to be what God would have them to be. I believe that one of the problems that uh, we see in our homes in America and even in the world today is that many families are not united. Gloria and I have worked at each funeral home in Paraguay, which a lot of you know. And you would think in a situation like that where a loved one has, has passed away that uh, if there had ever been any animosity, if there had ever been any ill will, that that animosity and that ill will would at least for the time being be set aside and they would get along. Well, that's not one of those things. There have been occasions where we've had to call the police to prevent any kind of violence. Now, you know, that's sad under any circumstance uh, in a funeral situation. But when it's family members that are beauty, family members that cannot get along, that doesn't speak well in that family does. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 25. It says, first of all, Jesus could be and then it says that he says to the people, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. 
Jesus is, is stressing in the most forceful terms possible the absolute essentiality of being united. Churches have crumbled because there was a lack of unity. And families have crumbled because they were not united. We often quote Psalms 133 verse 1 with reference to unity and all great. And it applies to that. But brethren and friends, I believe it just with equal force applies to the home situation. David says in Psalms 133 verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in that statement is true whether, again, you're talking about the home, the church, or the nation, or even among nations within the world. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. So that's not how Christian comes. And I would like to thank you, especially given the setting where I'm delivering this lesson. That each and every one of us would like to be a part of the Christian home. I'm, I'm giving us that much. I'm thinking that none of us want to live in the a, a kind of home that so many have in their lives today. <coughs> I believe one of the three references to having a Christian home is to be sure that God's word is called. The teaching of God's Word has always been required by Jehovah God. I don't care what dispensation you're talking about. I don't care what, what time frame you're talking about. God has always demanded that His Word be done. And that includes in the home situation. Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 and 10. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep them, or to keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. I know it's very carefully. The last sentence of verse 9. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren. I don't think it's been decided. It just works out. It just works out that way that as a grandparent, you can say something to your grandchildren. That could come the very same passage, the very same words from the parents, and the children might not listen. But coming from your mouth as a grandparent will probably all be yours. It just works out for you. And so that's why Solomon sent a reverend Moses says, and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. Now verse 10. Especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God and Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. You know, if that last line in both verses 9 and 10 about teaching children and grandchildren were omitted. These would be powerful readings. But they're made even more powerful when God showed the children of Israel their responsibility of making sure that the children and the grandchildren do this good. Maybe some of us are building on being very. I don't know if we're going to be 
lacks of nation. Maybe some of us are very lacks of nation or careless when it comes to teaching our children. Very don't have a set schedule, don't have a set time. I want you to notice how rigorous the schedule that God imposed upon the children of Israel were. I'm carrying them to the Lord. Right. 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 Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. I'm glad that you got to I'm glad that you got to I'm afraid that those things existed then these words of Moses would not have been as powerful. When you walk by the way, that's something else that we don't need to do much of it. When you lie down, you know, we live in a society where we may impose a curfew on our children. How great is it? When you rise up, well, that's not, that's not fair, is it? Us, we may get up and go off to work a little, little while later. The wife may get up and she may go about her daily activities.
Teenager back way back when. There's even more today. Even more in a different cast. Don't go wrong. Don't be like everybody else. Set the example before your classmates, before those that you hang out with day by day. You know, what are the real Christians? If there is anyone present, who needs to respond for any reason. We should come right now while we go to the stand and call this thing.